Welcome gamers to Master of Magic. <laughs> My name is Daz Tactic. I'm trying to do be more um, interactive and more um, sort of uh, yeah, interactive. <laughs> anyway, let's just get into it. This is a new series. We're going to be looking at the new or the coming Master of Magic, which is coming on December the 13th. So about two and a half weeks at time of recording. This is a press demo. So this is actually just a, uh, a bit of a demo of the game. And I thought I'd actually just sort of show it. Uh, for those of you that like strategy games, that like fantasy strategy games, you're gonna love this game. I can tell you that off the bat. Um, also, if you sort of shy away from more complex games, I think you might enjoy this one. Um, in term, I get asked a lot of questions when I'm live streaming this game uh, from people who, who used to love the old original, but have found it difficult to get into other more modern games and by more modern games we're talking about um, Age of Wonders like Age of Wonders 3 um, we're talking about um, what other ones uh, Dominions of course the Dominion series um, one thing that is mentioned a lot is the Fallen Enchantress the Fallen Enchantress game uh, that, that had come out a few years ago now but these are the sorts of games that people will play and I think if you liked Fallen Enchantress you're going to love Master of Magic um, Age of Wonders 3 and Dominions are on a whole other complexity level. So they're sort of up here. <laughs> the sort of Fallen Enchantress and Master of Magic is around about the middle. So in terms of, of its accessibility, it's gonna be fairly easy for people to get into. Now that doesn't mean it's a dumbed down game in, in any sort of sense. Each faction does play very, very differently. It's a game that's sort of easy to pick up but difficult to master. And I'll try to explain what the mechanics of the game actually are. This particular version of the game, or this you know, Master of Magic, this, the, the actual game itself, is not Master of Magic 2. It's not, a, it's, not a, it's not a progression from the 1995 version of the game. It's a reimagining, or not, it's, it's basically a reimagining of the 1995 game, keeping us true to the original in terms of its um, concepts and uh, mechanics. Uh, but still bringing it into a, into a modern t a modern time. And for me, they've done a brilliant, brilliant job, except for one thing. <laughs> one thing I really, really hate with this particular version of the game, or I could, I could see so many different ways of being able to improve it, and that's the uh, the damned surveyor mode. It, they've kept that in the game uh, as, a, as a throwback to the 1995 game for no good reason. There's not one single good reason for keeping it in the game. There's a lot of reasons to get rid of it. And so I really hope at some point they think, yeah, okay, that was a bad decision. Let's get rid of it and let's, let's uh, bring in the <laughs> what it should be, which is just map overlays. They could do that very, very simply with just a few different map overlays and have much, much better um, interaction, interactivity on the actual map itself uh, by ditching that one. But I'll show you that when we get into the game. So, so yes, I am a fanboy of the game. I'm a fanboy of the series, but um, I also do have some pretty strong ideas as to where I think the game works very, very well and where it doesn't work well. So I'll try to communicate that to you. Uh, so, but just be aware, I, I really do love the game. Um, so. Yeah, it's, it's up there. It's, it's right up there in terms of uh, what it actually does present. The game is published by Slytherin, who uh, has got just some such incredible games over the last few years in particular. Uh, some amazing games that they've actually got. And they got hold of the, um, of the license for Master of Magic. And so many people thought that they had the ability to create, a, to a, do a remake of Master of Magic, um, that then didn't really. And so there's been some pretty colossal failures over the years. There's been other games that sort of started off trying to be the spiritual successor to Master of Magic and then have had to sort of adapt and change into other, morph into other sorts of games. And Fallen Enchantress is, is one of those. Uh, Fallen Enchantress, fantastic game, I've got to say, like a brilliant game, particularly when it when it did come out. But it started off um, like as, as Elemental and Elemental, was adapted because at that, like at that, at that stage, I think Stardock thought that they actually had the, the license to make Master of Magic, but then it sort of there was, I think, a, some sort of legal battle and then they, they actually couldn't do it. But anyway, Slytherin did pick it up just recently and they've uh, handed the development over to Muha Games. Muha Games is a development company who built the Thea series, which is just a beautiful series uh, uh, that they actually did as, as a fantasy game as well. I thought it was a very inspired move to get Muha to actually build this version. I, I really can't think of any other developer that would be able to do justice to the original and and get this result like Muha. Muha just brilliant with what they've done with this. Um, so yeah, it's, it's 
like in terms of what we've got and in terms of what the brief and the brief really was to remake the original not to improve it not to sort of take it into a whole other realm it was just basically to improve it having said that i really look forward to see what this series can now start to spawn as it then moves forward so if there is going to be a Master of Magic 2 that will then follow this, I'll be really, really looking forward to seeing what they actually do with that. I, f I feel the game is in very, very good hands. So um, I'm not sort of at all concerned about uh, it sort of ending up being like, a, you know, a crazy sort of adaptation in uh, future years that just you know, people are going to be disappointed. I, I think it'll be very, very respectful to where it comes from. Anyway, let's not go on with it. Uh, this press demo um, is got, uh, we've got four wizards. We've actually got five races we can play, not four. Uh, only Sisra can, uh, Sisra can actually choose from the Mirren races. There's two Mirren races and three Arcan Arcanian races. Uh, the game will end after 150 turns. That's our big limitation. So good luck, wizard. Right, so what we're gonna do is we're just gonna go to new game. To try to get that 150 turn limit, I've reduced the wizards down from four to two. Okay, so I've, that's one change that I've made. The rest of these are pretty much as per the um, as per the original game. So you've got like your wizard picks, your starting gold. You've got like a few different sorts of uh, of AI skill levels as well. Advanced is actually not that easy, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to keep it on advanced. Uh, I would think I think I would struggle on skilled, uh, to be honest. So I'm just going to keep it on advanced. Uh, the neutral armies and layer defense. I have changed them from advanced to back to beginner, just to make them a little bit easier for us to break into, just to, because of the pacing again. Because we've only got 150 turns. If we didn't have that constraint, I think I would keep it on advanced. But uh, that's where we are. Uh, special events. Now this has actually been changed by Muha. So you've got three choices here. You've got the old original unmodified events like the original game. You've got the original updated modified to give player choices in the events, and you'll see that when we get into the game, or the updated original events plus new events that Muha have actually been adding in as well. So they've actually sort of taken that as something where they think that, okay, bit of license, we can sort of add things in there and, and make some changes there without it really impacting the original feel of the game. And I think they've done a good job of that. Very, very good job of that. Uh, having said that, <laughs> I'll try to think of all the little things that I really wish were in here. The choices that you have don't present when you first open it up. You've actually got to click on a button and then you're given the choices. You can accept or go to choices. And that's not a good mechanic. It should just be Here's your choices. Which one are you going to choose? Uh, I don't know why they did it that way. It's it's a strange, it's a strange decision. Anyway, that's sort of, yeah. So there's a few little things that that, that, that I hope that they will iron out. Uh, but as I say, I'm, I'm being very very nitpicky with that. Uh, battle movement cost. I have ramped this up to full cost. So if you are in terrain that's not suitable to you, it's going to slow you right down. Uh, world size is uh, is small. Initial economy is just going to be normal. You can actually also have a, a starting hero, which I'm not going to bother with. So you can sort of, there's only one to choose from at the moment. So let's actually not worry about that one. Um, and we'll just go continue. Okay, now we're just going to be playing as, I won't go into this in too much detail, but the new one that we have is uh, Rajak. So I'm going to choose Rajak. If I choose Sastra, this one is Mirren. So it's, it's from the Mirren Plane, where we got uh, where, where we can sort of essentially go and choose from either the Trolls or the Draconians in this particular build. But if we choose Rejack, we're stuck with the Arcanian uh, races. Uh, and Rejack, in a nutshell, is a very, very strong with, with death magic. So death magic is pretty much all that Rejack actually has. The others have got combinations largely, like Merlin is uh, is got life as well as nature. Uh, we've got Cherie who is death and chaos. Uh, and we have Sastra who is life and chaos as an example. And the others that we can't play just yet have got other sorts of specialities as well. But Rejack is specialized in, in death magic. Uh, we'll just go continue. Oh, by the way, sorry, I'll just go back. Uh, he also has Infernal Power. Now, what this one does, and we're going to be playing it, we're not going to be making the best use of this, but this one here allows you to have better morale or better, um, 
what do you have? You pacify unrest by getting religious buildings. Now, unfortunately, because one of the new factions is, is the lizards and I want to play them as well, I'm going to be using Rajak with the lizards. And that's not a good choice because of this infernal power. I'll show you that when we go across there. Now, I'm going to go, I'm going to ditch the skeletons initially. I'm going to keep weakness, dark rituals, cloak of fear I'll grab, black sleep, ghouls, um, terra mana leak. I'll get rid of I'll get rid of darkness and throw life drain in there. So I'll just grab those eight. I won't go, won't go through what these are until we actually get into the game. But that's the choice I want to make. So others of you will probably who are familiar with the original game may have a completely different set of choices that you would actually do yourself. Uh, back in through here. So the ones that we have, if we did play as Sastra, are the trolls, which have got regeneration. The draconians are, are flyers. They, so they're a flying lizard, with also with breath magic. Though, sorry, breath uh, breath attacks. Uh, back over through here, we've got the halflings, which are very good with their um, with their uh, sling slingers. Uh, that's a, that's for their special unit is the slingers. The high elves are a good one as well. Um, these are. Um, these are sort of like, yeah, these have got like Elven Lords and Pegasus units uh, and Longbowmen. Longbowmen are great uh, from the uh, from the actual Elves. and uh, But the Lizardmen are the one we're going to go with. Now, these have got a lot of buildings that they can't actually get. Now, three or two of these, the Sages Guild and the Parthenons, are religious buildings. And so we're not, this is going to really stymie us with what we need to do. But I still think we'll be okay. Our special uh, units are the Javelin Ears, which are really quite powerful, and the Dragon Turtle, which is also very, very powerful. Uh, it's a bit of a bit of a uh, game changer or game winner. Uh, the uh, the Dragon Turtle, extremely powerful unit. Uh, we'll go with purple down through this side. Um, you can pause and read this if you're wanting to, but I just want to get into the game, so let's just go with it. Uh, we'll begin, and then the game will uh, set itself up. And here we are. Now we've got to start with nothing in it. I think we might start again actually. What I'd like to do is actually present, um, we'll have a quick look inside Salt River. Yeah, there's no, no valuable resources. I think I want to start just so I can talk about um, the terrain. Uh, so I will actually do a restart. All right, this one will do us. So I had to restart a few different times. So if we just go back into Mud Spray, which is the name of our town, um, we can then sort of have a bit of a look. So we've got resources in through here. I'll sort of try to treat this almost like a bit of a tutorial. So if you are wanting to sort of get the game, or maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll come back and do the tutorial part of it. I'll race ahead a little bit just so we can get started. And then I'll come back in future episodes and just try to sort of go into detail as to what this particular screen has got. Uh, this is a good start for us for the simple reason we do pick up extra food from these. We've got extra four food. Uh, and we also have uh, coal there again, which we had seen there before. And so coal is going to uh, reduce the construction cost of normal units by 10%. And uh, we can change that into gems, which will then give us more gold if we need to. But we need to use a transmute spell to do that when we don't actually have that one in there. Uh, with these in through here, the extra food means that we don't have to have farmers. And so we're actually picking up six food uh, from what we're actually doing through here. So food is used to feed the town's population as well as your army is not stockpiled. If food supply does not meet demand, the, the town will starve and its population will decrease. Each two surplus food is always turned into one gold. And so in this instance, we've got uh, six out of four is required. Two extra, two extra food is being used, and so we end up with getting one gold in through there. I think that's maybe that may be taxes. Anyway, overall, our gold is going back by back by negative three. So we need to fix that. Uh, I will talk a little bit about what's going to happen with this now. If you might just show this now, if we go and I can change the taxes, it's not there's no big drama. If I do this one, we're going to negative five. If I go down to zero, negative seven. So that's actually with no income at all coming in. But there's no unrest at all uh, with global unrest to zero if we don't um, charge any taxes. Now, if we were swim, swimming in gold and gems and silver and things like this, we may be able to even get away with that. But really, the only reason that you worry about taxes is um, is first of all the benefit you get is the income the negative you get is the unrest in the actual town itself and so when we have a look across in, into here we've got zero unrest when it's zero like this if we make it go up to level one which is the default you'll see it's 20 here but in the town it's only 10. so something is changing this global unrest of 20 
back to 10. And so what that happens to be is the, um, is well, one of the big things is this lizard swordsman. This is a, considered a garrison unit. So I'm going to remove these from the town and we can then sort of see what happens. Now, if I increase the taxes, I can get this back down and stabilize the gold at this point in time. But our, our, our global unrest has now gone up to 20%. And when we have a look at this one here, we've got 20% unrest in through this side. We have 4,000 population. And so we essentially have four units, every thousand population, maximum of 26,000 back up through there. For every 4,000, for every thousand population, it's worth one population unit, which is one of these units in through here. So I've got four units working in production. Now, 20% of, of what we actually have through here will turn into rebels uh, with the, our current tax rate. And so at the moment, 20% of four is, uh, well, is, sorry, 20% yeah, of four is under, um, is like if, if we had five, it would, be, it would be one. So if we had one more, one more worker, that would then mean that we'd have one, as, one of them as a rebel. And so we would have no benefit. Rebels essentially don't generate food or gold or production. They basically just sit there and um, that it's not a, not a dramatic problem for you, but you do need to manage it. So you need to be aware of it. And so in this case, if I start to move my forces away, let's just go and do this now. Let's go and move the settler, which can move a bit further than the others. Let's go and move them out to, where should we move this one? Let's have a bit of a look around. Let's move it out to here. Now, there's no screaming rush to settle anything. Now, that looks like there may be gold underneath there. I'll talk about my pet peeve with the game very, very soon. What I might do is I might move the other group down into the south. So let's now just go and grab this uh, this swordsman and move him down this way. We just need to explore what's around us really uh, in the initial part of the game. We also have this as well, which is like a power node, which just didn't feature in what we were looking at through there. With the, uh, you can see there that we actually have built our city, Mud Spray is actually built right on the coast and is also right on top of, uh, of a, um, uh, like a wild game area. There's a wild game area in through there and we do actually have coal that was sitting right directly underneath us over this side. So um, if we go back into the town again now and have a bit of a look, well, ah, we've actually got ourselves one rebel. <laughs> so by moving the uh, garrison away, it's now put it up to the 30%. So if we keep a garrison here, we then end up being able to reduce unrest by actually having a garrison in the town. So what we what we want to do is whether we go this way or go down by one and make it 20%, the gold hasn't changed. So we're not getting any benefit by making the taxes higher. If I make them even higher than that again, it actually will go up a little bit at 45. We've still only just got the one in through this side. If I make it even higher again, 60%, we've now got two rebels. We're actually going, still going backwards. It's just not worth doing it. So for us, just keeping it at level one, with the, with the gold going backwards by three is about all we can really do without actually having a, um, a, a character sitting inside the actual city itself. So it may be worthwhile keeping a character there, but initially I really want to just do some scouting. So with that in mind, um, so we keep that one back in, into that side. That thing gives us the four production workers back and through here. So we end up creating these production hammers. We get nine production hammers because of these guys. And we can then start to go and build different things from the town itself. So we'll go and start our building queue before we do that, we can have a look and see what we've got in the city to start with. So we have a barracks, which is back over here. Uh, so um, we've got a smithy, and this is costing us one gold for the smithy, one for the builder's hall, one for the granary. And so the smithy gives us, um, where's that one? That's the smithy back in through there. I can right click on these to sort of see what it's going to say. Essentially, these unlock other buildings. The Builder's Hall as well unlocks other buildings. The Granary uh, back over this side is uh, going to give us extra food. So it does give us plus two food uh, to the actual city itself. And then we've got the Fortress in the middle here, which is uh, really like this is our seat of power along with the uh, Summoning Circle. So we will just go and close that one off. Um, actually, if we just go back into here. So you'll see that with our six food, we're getting two four and then the granary is giving us another two so that's the six so we're getting extras in through there which is then giving us extra gold as well so uh we'll just go into the build now we've got other things we can build we probably one of the good things to do with the game is to try to think okay well what where do i want to go like what do i actually want to have and ultimately we do want the dragon turtle we also want the javelin ears now the dragon turtle is going to require 
a um, an armorer's guild and a stables to actually get that one through there. It may also be that we want to get um, other things to help us along a bit as well. So we'll have a look at that as well. But the dragon turtle is sort of our best unit. The javelin ears are very, very useful. And this one requires the fighter's guild. This is our group of buildings back and through here. We can either build buildings or units. We can't build them concurrently. They have to be one or the other. Uh, we can queue them up though. And so when we have a look with those for those buildings, the Armourer's Guild, and we don't have very, playing as the lizards, they're quite simplistic because there's not very much that we need to do. Now to get the, to get the uh, Dragon Turtles, we actually need to have also the Fighter's Guild anyway. So to get the Armourer's Guild, we need, we, need the, uh, we need the Fighter's Guild. The Fighter's Guild is back up through here. The Fighter's Guild requires the Armoury. So to get these, it's just a bit of a progression to start to sort of pick up these things. It's a little bit too much. And really initially our, our goal is actually the problem. So we want to sort of be uh, fixing that up as much as we possibly can. So I don't think we'll bother going straight for these Javelin Ears. We can get simple Spearmen which cost us one food upkeep, but they're very, very weak. Or the Swordsman, which have got a melee attack of three, which is actually quite good, but it does cost us one extra gold as well with these sort of basic units. We also have Settlers, which we'll probably be wanting to get as well. Uh, but in this instance, I think we'll just have a bit of a look. We've got the Library, which will give us extra research. It's going to cost us a bit extra. The Armoury we saw there gives us progression. That will give us Halberdiers. These ones have actually got a melee attack of four, which is actually not, not bad. So they're better versions of the swordsman same cost as a swordsman but just a little bit better attack so that wouldn't be bad for us to go for uh, stables as we saw in through there nothing much really we're going to get uh, with that one so we'll just keep that one where that actually is the marketplace though is probably the one we want to go with so increases the taxable revenue of the city by plus 50 percent so i think we'll just grab that one the shrine as well now this is actually a religious building so and this, when we were looking at Radjack, and I was going to explain how this actually does work, we get an extra boost to our unrest levels by getting these buildings. So this would be a good one for us to get as well. But what we want really is to get money. So I'm going to start with the marketplace, and I will then just get the shrine straight away after it. So the reason for the shrine, when we hover over this one, so effects adds one extra power, which I'll explain in a minute as well, and allows the use of nightshade, which we don't actually have, and reduces the unrest level by an additional 10%. So that means that the 20% that we're currently running at in through here would be reduced to 10% if we did have that particular building. But it goes up by even more with our wizard. If we go and have a look at the actual wizard info for Rajak, he has got a trait. Now the trait in through here is infernal power, which basically is saying, if we just sort of skim to the important bits there, uh, unholy influence dominates divine and increases the power gain and the pacifying effects, lowering unrest that the wizard obtains from all their religious buildings by 50%. So in that case, we essentially get like 15% unrest from that particular building. And then if we go and uh, if we go back and have another look at the buildings and through this side again. So the first one we get would be the um, would be this one here, which then leads on to the temple. The temple in through this side is as far as we can go, unfortunately, which reduces it by another 10%. So we get a little bit of extra bonus in through there. They're the two buildings we're going to be wanting to get because it's going to allow our unrest to, um, to be much, much more manageable. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's the that's the approach. So we're just going to focus on our economy to start with and then sort of come back in. But we're trying to manage these rebels to a degree. Like it's not something we have to focus on too much. We'll just close that one through there. We've got a couple of things. The, the construction queue, we do actually do have a plan in there at this stage to get the marketplace. Also, when we, like this one over through here, this, this particular one is going to be costing us three gold upkeep per turn. So if we can settle somewhere, we're going to then save ourselves three gold. So that's another another consideration. This one over through here is just worth one gold to us. So just one gold upkeep back and through this side. I'll explain this when we get into fights as to what these actually do. Uh, we actually have research that we can now go and choose. Now I sort of want to go and get some of the early ones. Some of these will be from our second tier, like the Black Prayer, for example. Is a um, is an enchant enchantment, um, and a holy prayer calls on the power of the fallen and divine. All enemy units of melee range, uh, thrown fire attacks and armor are reduced by negative one, and the resistance by negative two. That's not a bad one, but initially we just have to we have to crawl before we walk. So let's just get the skeletons. We can get them pretty quickly. Let's go and research those. Uh, we can end the turn. We've done this 
building queue, like we've sort of already got our building queue sorted, so we don't need to look at that one. But if we have a look at uh, back into here, these are, in the old game, you used to sort of have to go in and, and actually have a look at different things to sort of then be able to, um, to pick up uh, like you know the different aspects of the game they've now been just put up into the top here which makes a lot more sense with a modern game so the wizard info we saw there we've got Rajak in through there but summary of what we've got the traits we can go to the history which will then over time will then just give us different graphs which is great as well so when we come across other factions we can just get a, an indication as to where we we were sitting as well we have a victory screen which is just sort of showing you can either research or cast the spell of mastery to win the game as well which we won't ever be able to do that with 150 turns but anyway that's something we can aim for <laughs> uh, the next one across is just our list of cities which we will be using as we get more and more cities uh, the enchantments we actually have in this particular city we do actually have shore so we have a shoreline in through this side as well but again we won't worry too much about that one in through there this is our armies we've got two armies at this point in time so again we can just very quickly sort of see what's going on through there this here is our magic now we've got nine power at the moment uh, the town's income is nine, and so if we go back and have a look at our towns, we'll then see that this is our power. So the power is coming through the towns, and as we get more towns and, and more power nodes, we'll be able to then increase this. So that power is then split up into mana, which we can then use for spell casting, research, and also for casting skill to sort of improve our ability to then do do actual casting. Now. At 333, it's very, very weak. I think we'll just keep it where it actually is. When we get the shrine, it'll go up to 10, for example, so we'll get a little bit extra. Uh, we can shuffle these around if we wanted to, but let's just leave it where that actually is at this point in time. We also have diplomacy, which we don't have anything any use of just yet. There's no, We don't know of any other wizards. And uh, game options, which are fairly simple uh, at this point in time. All right, let's uh, continue on. It will end our turn. And we'll just keep on sort of marching down. Now, these are, like when we see these beams of light, it means we don't know what's inside them. And it's a good idea because sometimes you will actually be able to pick up stuff for free. So let's have a bit of a look in here. So ancient temples are relics of ages past. It's guarded. This one's guarded by ghouls. And it's the, the indication, this is actually new to the game. There was actually in Caster of Magic a similar thing where you could actually use a, uh, a familiar to be able to um, uh, to give you guidance, and it used to cost you a little bit of your um, your uh, victory score. <laughs> but I found it super super useful. And this is saying that we've got we haven't got a hope in hell with our with our guy of defeating the ghouls, so we won't definitely won't go ahead with that one. We have a choice to uh, to essentially disengage. So we'll do that one. By the way, the cat is the is the death magic familiar. There's different familiars for each of the actual types of magic. Uh, so we'll just move it the other army now. I want to find I want to sort of look for other resources So let's just keep on sort of rattling through I won't go after all of these we can also walk on the water So we might have a bit of a look there's more do we can see that there's more uh, game over this way But uh, I'm looking for other like better resources Let's just end our turn again more down this way okay move army just have a bit of a look so there's more game if we can find something close to the, to our city where we can settle and uh, and get like a, a good result that would be great there's more game over there as well that we can see in the fog of war uh, we'll end our turn just keep on having a look just in case yeah, this one is a Pegasus. There's a 30% chance we'd actually be able to... Oh, this is a Unicorn, sorry. There is a chance we'd be able to take this one out, but not, not good enough for us. Don't engage. So we'll just keep on going this way. Move the army. Now, one thing we can do... I will actually show the, the one aspect of the game that I really don't like. What I would love in the game would be... A, uh, a couple of different, instead of having this uh, surveyor mode, which I really find so dysfunctional, um, it's a, it is actually a, a throwback to the 1995 game because it had a surveyor mode. It was the only way, when you've got 480 pixels, <laughs> that's, you know, you really, your, real, your on-screen real estate is really, really valuable. And so you've got to sort of find ways to present information. And so they had a surveyor mode in the original game where 
it would give you information in your 480 pixels, but we have much, much bigger screens now, guys. So uh, we don't need to be using a surveyor mode. Surveyor mode is essentially, you've got to turn it on to be able to then go and see what's around you. So it'll give you information about the uh, about the locations, like the wild game, uh, mysterious cave, which is unexplored. If I go to one of the ones that is explored, so if I just zoom on down to here, for example, and hover over there, we can see that this is an ancient temple with one times ghoul. So it presents good information, but we don't need it because we could actually just have, we could have um, uh, screen overlays to sort of give us this information if we if we wanted to. We could have a screen overlay for resources. We could have a screen overlay for, uh, and you can see there, this is, um, yes, this one here, for example, the city resources, it, it gives me information directly as to maximum population is 20, production bonus is plus 32, which is actually fairly good. So that's actually not bad at all to actually have that information. So why isn't there just a, um, a, a map overlay here for for settlement, which would then sort of tint this a different color, say like a pink color or something over the top of the other color. And then you go immediately into this mode anyway, and it just t it still works as the um, as a surveyor mode, but at least you can see where you can settle. God, that would make that life so much easier and so, so 2022. <laughs> <laughs> as opposed to this, which is just no good reason for this. This is my biggest problem with this game. And I, I really, I just cannot fathom why this is in here. It's, um, yeah, it just blows my mind. Anyway, that's, <laughs> that's just something. That's my, that's my big, big pet peeve of the game uh, is that particular aspect. The, um, the other thing I would like to see would be, again, map overlays to go through the resources, map overlays to go through the, uh, you know, to what we know about the actual, uh, the, the, I guess, the, the different sorts of, of areas, you know, with the different sorts of threat levels as well. I just think that that would just be such a, a, a better and more compact way of actually handling this information rather than having the person you know sort of look to see okay where can I settle you know which one's which one's the best one for me uh, what do I get for all this sort of stuff you know can I sort of go back into here and so what I can do is I can start to triangulate a little bit now four away one two three four I know that if I go there the town that's been four away is this one here if I go to here though, it's saying there's another another town within four of this particular area. So I can't settle anywhere in here anyway. So that one's also saying an existing town. So there must be a town down this way somewhere. So it could end up being one, two, three. It could be anywhere in here. Anywhere in here. So we'll need to go and try to find that. So we'll have a look to see what we've actually got, what we're up against. Um, I'll just right click with that one. We still got this unit in through here. I might just move on to the hill. Uh, this one did actually have, if I just press tab again, we do actually have a plus 32 production, 20 population, 21 and 20 there. I've still got two more moves. I might actually just move up and uh, then move down. We'll just have a bit of a look to see. Just press tab again, right click. And so this is actually a gateway that takes us back out. Actually, let's just press tab again. What have we got in through there? 20 and 14, 20 and 29 is actually not too bad. 20 and 32 is a better option though. Um, I'll move on to here actually, just so we can see what's on top of these mountains on the other side. So we can start to, again, just start to triangulate 18 and 32, 18, yeah, so 19 and 32. That one's uh, got a monster layer, so we can't do much about that one. Oops. But I find this, I don't know why that's in the game, to be honest. I, I just, I don't think it's a good a good addition. It's, it's something that I've complained about ever since I first saw it. Um, so probably will, people get sick of me actually bitching about that one, but I do, I just can't see a good reason for it. Uh, we're not still not finding any good resources anywhere. I think I'm just gonna keep on looking for a little bit longer. Let's just end our turn. Okay, master of cumbering gifts, I offer you a magic spirit. They're great scouts, and once you conquer a, a power node, they can meld with it and provide power for you. So we, we'll accept this one in through here. This is a power node. We do want these fairly fairly uh, early if we can get to them. Um, okay, let's just move down. So we're sort of now seeing a bit more back in through this side. Just go a little bit further. Yeah, we're not seeing much in here. We're really not finding much in the way of um, areas we can settle into. Uh, is there anything under there? No, it's just a monster lair. Really, it's only wild game is the only thing we've actually found. So it's pretty sparse. 
what we can actually do, go and get. It's funny because it looks like there's something under there, but I don't think it is. It's the same as all of this. Anyway, I've run out of time, guys. I'm going to leave this episode here. Thanks for watching, and I'll catch you in the next episode. Uh, very, very good game, though. Even though I'm scathing about this bloody surveyor mode, it's a very, very, very good game.